one more prayer. You are the truth. Lord, we pray, show us that fact. Amen. First time I knowingly lied that I can recall, I was five years old, and I had discovered a pair of scissors in our home. My mom and dad had just bought brand new living room curtains, this gold, shimmery, beautiful curtains. It was just fine fabric, and it was just... So I went with the scissors, and was, I used to always be behind the curtains. <laughs> Me behind the curtains. Uh, I used to love living behind the curtains, and I was there with the scissors, and all of a sudden I saw the edge right in the center of where the two curtains meet, and I cut a three-centimeter cut horizontally into one of the curtains, and it just the, the action of those scissors cutting that curtain and then I looked at what I did, and I went up another three centimeters and cut another one. <laughs> and then I realized that I may be in trouble for this little experiment of mine. So I took off, and maybe a couple of hours later, I think my mom noticed, and uh, being a good mom, kind of took me by the shoulder over to the curtains and showed me these newly trimmed curtains and asked me if I knew what was going on, how this happened. And I looked at her and I told her wholeheartedly that I had nothing to do with this. I think I probably blamed my younger sibling, Al, for it, who was quiet and introverted and took a lot of heat on my behalf. And I remember the moment because I knew something but I said something else. It took me about two hours to make the confession. Two hours of shame and guilt and carrying the weight of this deception that I had spoken to my mom. I lied to my mother. And I remember how good it felt, how bad it felt, how good it felt to finally tell her that it was me. The ninth commandment says, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor, so don't lie about them. But then that rotten catechism broadens the interpretation of the command and says, I must avoid all lying and deceit. No problems in our world today to avoid lying and deceit. Quote I read a few years back, a study by Dr. I think it was in the Herald, a study by Dr. Robert Feldman showed that within 10 minutes of meeting a new person, 60% of people will tell at least one lie. Sorry, just as I'm making that point, I'm looking at a politician. Sorry, Joan. <laughs> A stereotype, right? <laughs> uh, oops. Uh, could have kept that to my inside voice. <laughs> or a marketer, or a salesperson, or a... Back to Dr. Robert Feldman. Within 10 minutes of meeting a new person, 60% of people, all of us, will tell at least one lie. The average number of lies a person will tell in that first 10 minutes is three. Most people in the study didn't believe the results, but when the videotaped sessions were shown back to them, they were stunned to see that they had indeed lied, and in many cases they'd lied repeatedly. The average American, you may have heard this quote before, tells approximately 200 lies per day, which means the average Canadian tells 20 lies per day. <laughs> and I don't doubt the numbers, the 200 number, at all when you really start to think about it and unpack it and get honest with yourself. When you start to think about all the little white lie, there's your first deception. These are, these are white lies versus the black lies. I don't doubt for a minute that over a hundred times a day I'll say one lie in one way, shape, or form. The times that I fail to tell the truth, 
the whole truth or nothing but the truth. Grew up hearing that phrase, but if you think about what that means, telling the truth, so not telling the, not, the untruth, is one way of lying. Telling the whole truth, so not holding back on something you know that is true about the thing you're talking about, or shading it, or spinning it, and not telling more than the truth in order to accomplish those same things. So, the kinds of lies that came to mind for me, I'm not projecting any of this because I've got these things figured out. Lying to avoid hurting others. Lying to avoid conflict. To avoid discomfort. To build yourself up. Think of that party. What do you do for a living? I do way more book writing and... uh, speaking in places at parties when I get asked what I do for a living. Lying to give yourself more pleasure or to please others or to deceive yourself so you can live within the comfort of the denial and the little cocoon that you've built around the glittering image of who you are. Lying to hurt another person, knowingly or not, to protect another, to cover up, to distract from yourself, to make the deal, to close the sale. If I'm brutally honest, and if you are too, there is a lot more deception and lying going on than we would care to admit. And as I read that list that I just read to you, the common denominator in all of those things is you, is ourselves. We as human beings are prone to telling lies. I remember sitting in a conference 10 years ago and Jim Collins, a business guru, was talking about conflict and conflict management and I was a conflict avoider and I don't like having conflict with people and, you know, because I don't want to hurt somebody, I don't want to make them feel uncomfortable, I don't want to make it difficult for them. You know, so I had all this rationale built around my glittering image of being a nice guy who didn't want to in entering the conflict, and he just unpacked every argument I had and basically forced me into the place where I realized the only reason I avoid conflict is because I want to look great. I want to raise up my self-image. I want to be the nice guy. I don't want to ever say hard things. It was all about me. I'm a liar. And everyone does it. So, like, lighten up, John. (laughs) Stop the guilt trip. Don't be so hard on yourself. Our world is filled with deception. And this is true. But surely people who claim a faith in a God that is truth ought to want to and ought to live up to a different standard. Shouldn't the truth matter more to you, to me? was the question that unsettled me today. And as soon as I asked it, I thought of Dr. Ian Leggett, Old Testament professor back in seminary 20 years ago. Gray hair, side part, full-on Baptist, you know, serious guy, very cognitive and intellectual. And he's preaching a cor- teaching a course on the prophets. And halfway through the course, I don't even know what he was talking about, but he was talking about prof- prof- prophets stating truth and reality for what it is. And all of a sudden, he pauses and he starts weeping in front of a hundred students. He's just weeping, not just like a tear that he had to wipe. He loses it, evidencing that he's made in the image of a God whose truth is so true that any lie and a world filled with deception would be heartbreaking. And the man's weeping at the fact that the truth has been so hidden that nobody cares. He echoed the heart of God. Prophet Jeremiah, these are hard words. Beware of your friends. Do not trust anyone in your clan. For every one of them is a deceiver, and every friend a slanderer. 
Friend deceives friend, and no one speaks the truth. You, know, you think about churches. A church, I demonize the church I grew up in, but nobody spoke, well, we rarely spoke the truth to each other. Everybody was nice, and it was pathetic. Friend deceives friend, and no one speaks the truth. They've taught their tongues to lie. They weary themselves with sinning. You live in the midst of deception. In their deceit, they refuse to acknowledge me, declares the Lord. God hates lying. And to lie, according to the prophet, is to not acknowledge God. So every time we lie, we're saying we don't believe in the God of truth. God is truth. It is impossible, the writer of the Hebrews writes, for God to lie. He has never lied to you. And God sees and hears and knows everything. You think your mom knows when you're the five-year-old lying to her. He sees every, hears every word. 